So now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about other ISAs than just the MIPS one we've talked about so far. So we've looked at MIPS in many detail, in a lot of detail, but there are a bunch of other things that we should think about. So the most common ISAs today are x86, which is what Intel and AMD sell, and this is what you have in most laptops, desktops, and servers, and ARM. And ARM itself doesn't sell any chips, but they sell chip designs to people. Samsung and Apple, for example, build these in their cell phone and mobile products, and both Samsung and Apple build their own ARM processors, so they design them from scratch. These are the most common ones, but there are a lot of others. So Java has its own ISA. When you compile Java code, it gets compiled down for the Java virtual machine in its own ISA. When you use an NVIDIA graphics card, you're compiling your shaders for rendering your graphics down to an ISA they call PTX. PowerPC is also an architecture and ISA, which IBM and Motorola sell. And the Spark ISA is sold by Oracle, which used to be Sun, and Fujitsu. They both make processors that use this ISA. And of course, there are lots of other ISAs for more specific things. For example, the ISA that's used in your washing machine or your dryer is probably an 8051. Now let's take a look at a few of the issues that come up here. Machine types, ISA classes, things to do with addressing modes, how do they access memory, issues with instruction width, and then finally we're going to talk about CISC or complex instruction set computing versus RISC or reduced instruction set computing. So what are the basic types of machines that we can think about? Well, they're memory to memory machines. And these machines are where instructions can directly manipulate memory. So you could say memory address 0 equals memory address 1 plus memory address 2. We can't do this in MIPS. In MIPS, everything has to go through the register file. But there's some problems here. If you need to store a temporary value, you don't have a register file. You have to put all your temporary values in memory, and memory is slow. So this slows down the program. Memory is also big, so that means that instructions like this need lots of bits for addresses. So in a 32-bit machine here, I need one, two, three 32-bit addresses to do this one add instruction. So obviously what we've been looking at are register machines. And the idea here is that we have a register file which holds a small number of temporary variables. The benefit here is since the register file is small, it can be a lot faster, which means our programs can run faster. We have fewer addresses in code, since most of the time we use the register file, so we get smaller programs. Sounds good. But it's never that simple. So x86, which is the most common ISA today, has a few registers and supports memory operations. This is known as a register memory architecture, so you have sort of the best and the worst of both of these sides. ARM, which is a very common ISA today, has a whole bunch of fancy addressing modes which complicate register operations, and of course in all of these architectures if you run out of registers you still have to use memory anyways. So it's not that register machines avoid needing to use memory, they just make it most of the time you can use the register file. So let's talk about basic classes of ISAs. So the simplest ISA is an accumulator. You can think of this having one register. You basically have one register which is your accumulator. And so you say something like add A. And what does add A do? Well, it goes and gets A from memory and adds it to the accumulator. You have general purpose register file. This is what we saw in MIPS here, where you can do three, ad three register operations and you can load things from memory. We have general purpose register files like x86, which are register memory. And here you have some more flexibility. So I can say add a particular register to an address. And this instruction will both go get the memory from there and do the addition. You have a stack machine, which isn't a register file. And here you talk about the top of stack. So if I just say add, I don't specify anything else. What it does, it says put on the top of the stack whatever was on the top of the stack before, plus the thing that's on the next part of the stack. And you might think this is a strange way to build a machine, but this is actually the way Java code works. Now, how do you compare these different things? Well, you could look at how many bytes you need for each instruction. You could look at the number of instructions you need to write a program. You could look at the speed. But really, what you care about is a combination of those. So when you design a machine, what you really want is something that works well for a whole bunch of applications. So let's do a little comparison across these things. So here's code for C equals A plus B, and we're going to look at four machines. A stack machine, accumulator, a register memory, and a register load store machine. So for the stack machine here, we have many very small instructions. So we need to get A and B and put them on the stack, then we need to add them, then we need to take the result off and store it to memory. This is example what Java code is going to look like. 
If we have an accumulator, we just load it. This puts it in the accumulator. We add B to the accumulator, and then we store it to C. And this is a rather old-fashioned architecture because it needs very few registers, and this uses used processors like the 8051, which is a very common microcontroller in things like washing machines and dishwashers today. The register memory architecture this is what we have in x86 here. This we do something nice. So we get small code here. We can specify a memory address and say, oh, just load that into register 1. Then we can add this into register 1 and store the result back. So we can specify the instructions that have both a register and a memory. And then if we look at purely register ones, this is what we saw in MIPS, but PowerPC, ARM, and Spark also look a lot like this, we need a lot of instructions. So we have to load both from memory, then add them, and then store the results back. So we get lots of simple instructions in the load store register architecture. Another thing that's interesting to look like are addressing modes. This is how do you access memory? And note, not all of these are in MIPS. So the top ones here, these are all in MIPS. So you can specify in terms of adding an immediate, a register, you can have some sort of displacement. These are all in MIPS. But there are a whole bunch of other really weird ones that you can have in there. Not all of them are really weird, but they're generally pretty specialized. So let's look at these ones down here. So auto increment and auto decrement. What do these addressing modes do? Well, you can see it's going to go and access memory, but when it accesses memory, it's going to increment the address. So it's going to say, go get the data at this location, and while you're at it, increment the location by one, or decrement the location by one. Now why do you want these sorts of mo addressing modes? Well these addressing modes are really great if you're doing signal processing. So you have a signal that you want to go through really quickly, you can save the extra instruction for having to add or decrement it. Down here we have an even more complicated a scaled addressing mode, and if you look at the computation that's done here, this is the computation you need in order to access a 2D array of data. So these here are really helpful if you're going to be processing arrays of data and are found all over the place in digital signal processors today. So let's talk about another thing that varies between ISAs, and that's instruction widths, or the number of bits you need for each instruction. And there are two types basically, variable width and fixed width. So in variable width you can have different widths for different instructions. So for example in x86 you can have 2 to 6 bytes for an add instruction or 2 to 4 bytes for a load instruction. So that's a little confusing, but it's great for generating compact code. So in MIPS, everything is four bytes. But here in x86, you can get just two bytes for a load, so you can make much smaller code. But it also means it's hard for the hardware to know where the instructions start and stop. In MIPS, you just load the next four bytes, and you know it's an instruction. In x86, you have to decode those bits in order to figure out if it's a two-byte, four-byte, or six-byte instruction. In fixed width, all the instructions are the same width, and this is great. Everything is the same width, it's simple for the hardware, but it means larger code. So even if you didn't need all four bytes to say it was an add, as you do in x86, you still had to use four bytes. There's another option here, which is multiple widths. So both ARM and MIPS support a mixture of 32-bit and 16-bit instructions. And the idea here is that by using 16-bit instructions, you can get more compact code but it's harder for the hardware to know what to do. So you can trade off these two things when you write your code. So today, general purpose register machines are the only thing out there. Everything uses general purpose registers. And the advantage of this are primarily that they're faster. Accessing memory is 200 to 600, depending on how you count it, times slower than accessing a register file. And that's just too much to not use a register file. Other benefits of register files, you can hold temporary variables, so it makes it easier to break up complex operations, so it's easier for the compiler. And you get improved code density. So you don't need to have memory addresses all over your code, so you can have much smaller code than if you had to specify lots of memory addresses. So while I said this is true, we just talked about how x86, one of the most common ISAs today, is a memory register architecture. So what's going on? I'm telling you that everything uses general purpose register files, but I'm also telling you that one of the most common ISAs today is a memory register ISA. So what's going on here? We'll get to that in just a minute. First, a question. So what kind of processors take more instructions to compute C equals A plus B, where A, B, and C are all in memory? Well, the answer here is that the load store machines, sort of like the MIPS one, they take more instructions. So you can take an example here. Here's register memory. We can specify where to load and store the data in the instructions. 
With a register load store thing, we have to load directly into the register file and then we have to explicitly store. So it's going to take more instructions this way. So a register memory machine will actually take fewer instructions here. So general purpose registers are better than memory register machines for all but the following reasons. Well, easier assembly code. If you have a memory register machine, it's easier to write code because you can specify the memory address directly in your code and you don't have to load it into a register file first. However, almost nobody writes assembly code these days, so this really isn't much of an advantage. But that's the reason why x86 started this way, so that it was easier to write code for the processor.